Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. This is a three month vacation. I'm Sean D'Souza. Around the start of 2010, I was pretty upset with myself. I'd pre sold a workshop, and as I always do, the notes for the workshop are sent to the attendees a whole month in advance. Since the workshop was being held early in the year, I had been thinking about the notes right through my summer break and then in late December and early January. Now, the topic was uniqueness, and uniqueness is a pretty difficult topic to cover. I needed to find a way to ensure that everyone, without exception, got the concept of uniqueness and was able to implement it. The only problem with writing the notes was that it seemed like the notes were going to be at least 200 pages long. 200 pages is like a security blanket for a writer. In the mind of a writer, the chunky volume of notes seemed to suggest that you have something important to say. And yet, my wife Renuka isn't a big fan of a ton of notes. Why can't you write fewer pages, she asked me as we were sitting at the cafe. Why can't you get the same point across so that I don't have to read so much? A pointed question like this is truly frustrating for me because I know that it's easier to fill a book with a ton of information. But a book, or notes in this case, need to be spartan. They only have to have enough pages, just enough knowledge, for the client to get a result. They don't need to be padded or filled with words that no one needs. And this meant that I had to go back to my outline several times. When writing a book, the most difficult task isn't the writing. Distilling the ideas down to simplicity is what gets in the way. I have to force myself to leave the office, sit at the cafe for hours at a time, with no internet connection. Monday's roughs give way to Tuesday, which gives way to Wednesday, and by Friday I have a completely different draft. Sometimes it can take a month of drafts to just get my thoughts together. Except, it was already January. The clock was ticking and my deadline was approaching, so I had to make sure that I had to get that book going, which is why you and I we both need an outline. So how do you outline a book? What method should you use? What if you can't write a lot and can only manage a few pages? Should you just give up? Let's explore three elements of book outlining and we'll get on our way. So the first element is why you should ideally cover just three points. The second element is why deconstruction is important to get you going. And the third thing is understanding the purpose of the book. Let's start off with the first thing, which is why we should cover just three points. When you think of a topic like presentations, what comes to mind? Let's make a list, shall we? Creativity, crafting stories, simplicity, delivery, audience connection, engagement, displaying data, creating movement, titan keeping. These points are just a tiny bit of your list or my list. Now, if you were to look at Amazon.com alone, you'd find possibly 100 or 200 books on this single topic of presentations. It's at this time that a novice or unthinking writer decides, well, I'm going to cram as many items as I can possibly put into one book, just to make sure that nothing is missed. So if we took a topic like watercolors, for instance, 
Back in 2010, I was pretty hopeless at watercolors. And that's when the painting bug struck me. Now, how hopeless is hopeless? I painted for three months. I faithfully followed the instructions of my teacher, Ted. And after three months, the area that I was painting in, the place called Myrungi Bay, they had an auction of the artwork. And my painting came up on the auction block. The starting price for my painting was $30. And there were no takers. So it went down to $20. Wait, auctions are not supposed to go down. They're supposed to go up. But there was the painting at $10. And still, no one was buying it. Now, you'll have to agree, it's a pretty hopeless situation. Anyway, to avoid such a high level of embarrassment in the future, I decided to take watercolors a lot more seriously. So I went to the library, I came back with at least a dozen books on watercolors. And then I opened up book after book, and what happened was I started to see a very similar scenario unfolding. Every book seemed to feel this need to cover every possible topic under the broad umbrella of watercolor. This is the kind of mistake you want to avoid as a writer. The journey to outlining just about anything, a book, an article, even the weather report, it's better served by working on three elements, three main topics, and then digging deep into the substrata of every one of those topics. Ironically, though, you have to start with the entire mess. You have to begin your journey by being reasonably crazy and listing everything, which means you've got to roll out two steps. Step one, list all the points, all the topics you can think of. And step two is choose three points. Take, for example, the topic of pricing. If you were to gaze deep into the crystal ball of pricing, you'd be sure to run into dozens of topics and angles. If you were to try and cover every possible scenario in pricing, even at the brainstorming stage, it kind of drives you crazy. But it's okay, let your imagination go on that rodeo as you list everything that you can cover. An exhaustive list is not a bad thing. It demonstrates how much you know and how much you can cover in the future. However, once you're done with that list, it's time to pick the three elements that will go into your book. You have to wiggle your way into step two and choose just three points. The problem with step two is deciding which points to choose. You'd probably think it's crazy to choose any random point, but that's usually what I do. Take the book Black Belt Presentation. Well, it's not a book, it's a series. Now, I didn't set out to write a series. I set out to write a single book. And when we look at the huge list we can muster from a single visit to Amazon, I decided to simply choose the three elements that I considered to be important. And so we had one, controlling the visual aspect, which is how to create stunning slides. Two, Controlling the structure of the presentation, which is how to build the presentation with amazing flow. And three, controlling the audience. Why a great presentation can be ruined if you're not prepared for the reality of an audience. So I had these three things. And when outlining, you have to take the role of a GPS. There are a thousand points that you could cover, but it's so easy to get lost. Instead, cover just a few points, ideally no more than three main points. So were there more topics to cover? Sure there were. Would I cover it? Maybe in another book, a series of podcasts, maybe some articles. But as a writer, a creator, a weather reporter, you can't really go digging into every single cloud or that spotty bit of sunshine. You have to make a decision, and you have to make a decision to drop stuff. To take a simple analogy, think of a sculptor, or rather, a dozen sculptors, all with similar blocks of marble. The job of the sculptor 
is to remove the bits that don't matter so that they can reveal the sculpture. Yet when you look at the finished work of a dozen artists, you'll notice that they all end up with different types of sculpture. Given the same topic, which is presentations, you have to get rid of all the subtopics that you can't possibly cover and stick with just three. Three, not four or five. I've got The Paradox of Choice, which is a book by Barry Schwartz, and it's sitting on my desk. It's gathered a little bit of dust because it's been around since 2004, but when I open the table of contents, what is it that holds the 250 pages of the book together? It's the topics, and there are four, not three. The first one is when we choose, the second is why we choose, the third is how we suffer, and the fourth is what we can do. And nestled under these four categories are what Schwartz needs to say. Even though you can clearly spot 10 or even 11 chapters in one prologue, they are still magnificently constrained by the limitations of four topics. When you look at the brain audit, you don't quite see that in the table of contents, do you? The brain audit is split up quite clearly into seven chapters. And yet, there is an overlying structure to the book. The first three chapters are about attraction. They're solely dedicated to getting the client's attention. The next four chapters are all about risk. It's what causes the client to back away, to get all hesitant, even though they seem to be so interested in your product or service. So these books, they have this overlying grid, this overlying structure, and that's what enables the writer to put it together. But what if you don't have such a clarity of vision? How are you supposed to know that one topic will seamlessly fit into another? The reality is that you don't need any such seamless fit at all. Three random topics can fit together quite nicely. To demonstrate this magic trick, let's take the list that we created above. Let's first randomly take the three topics that we have, which is creativity, crafting stories, and simplicity. These three topics work together, don't they? So let's take the next lot. Delivery, audience connection, and engagement. Again, it fits perfectly for presentations. So let's move to the third lot. Displaying data, creating movement, and timekeeping. Now, you may find that timekeeping doesn't require an entire chapter, and if that's the way you feel, then simply get rid of the topic and slide in one that makes you feel comfortable. For example, displaying data, creating movement, audience connection. Writing a book may seem like a daunting and reasonably frustrating experience. An enormous amount of frustration bellows forth from the need to cover everything in sight. Instead, if you were to cover three topics, almost any three topics, you could seamlessly stitch them together to create a fantastic outline. You still have to do a fair bit of work. You still have to get that book written. But the battle is won or lost at the outline stage. You have to train your outline to sit, to beg, to play dead. And then you have vaporized the biggest and the most frustrating headache of all. This takes us to the second bit where you outline the personality of your book. To get onto this fascinating trip of structuring the personality of your book, you have to dig into a whole bunch of books that you love. It's time to use the power of deconstruction to get going. So how do you systematically outline a book? How do you get it off the ground with deconstruction? Let's find out. Imagine you're the emperor in a far-off eastern land. Your son, Kintsukuroi, is about to go through the ceremony of investiture. The bowl is the most important symbol of this rank, and it's being given to this young prince, this, this whole bowl. And yet, the king goes to his cabinet, he finds that magnificent bowl, but it is broken up into a hundred pieces. 
Now, brokenhearted at the wanton destruction of this incredible piece of art, the emperor retires to his private chambers, and he wants to share his sorrow with his son. The night passes quietly. But in the morning, there is this huge commotion. The cabinet of treasures has been broken into, and not only have the pieces of the bowl disappeared, but the jeweled crown for the prince, which was to be used for the investiture ceremony, that's gone too. What's worse is that the thief was seen running towards the prince's quarters. Could the guards break down the door? Why was there smoke coming out of the prince's quarters? This mystery was solved the next day when the bowl reappeared, whole again, but glistening with veins of gold where the cracks had once been. And the prince appeared at the investiture ceremony later in the day, except he had a thinner crown, depleted of much of its gold. Kintsukuroi means to repair with gold in Japanese. And it is the art of repairing pottery with gold and understanding that the piece is more important, more beautiful for having been broken. When you create the outline of a book, you deliberately have to break or deconstruct the work of others. That way, you can engage in kintsukuroi and you can reconstruct your own book in a way that's far superior. And that's exactly what I did back in 2002 when I started writing the earliest version of the Brain Audit. I was brand new to marketing and writing. And so just 16 pages of the Brain Audit book took me well over a week. Even the introduction derailed me quite a bit. So I turned to a book that I loved a great deal called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. His introduction seemed so unstuffy, so well put together. And he had a ton of graphics in his book. Right then and there, I decided that my book would have a similar tone of voice and style. When outlining your book, it's easy to get caught up in the construction of your own words, your own pages. And yet, it's pretty important to go through at least six or eight books that you love. If only to understand the underlying structure. Take, for instance, most of the psychotactics books or courses. There's a structure to the book that you may have noticed or may not have noticed, but you might not have paid great attention to it. So this is how the book rolls out. It starts off with the introduction, and the introduction is followed by three main topics. Every topic goes deep into subtopics. As you wander through the pages of the book, you'll run into cartoon after cartoons captions, stories, and a dozen, maybe two dozen, four dozen examples, fly-out boxes, summaries, a food recipe, and so on. So this is the underlying structure that makes the book so easy to read. It's the powerhouse that pushes you forward, making sure that you get to the last page. Compare this with a book that has no summaries, no visuals, no captions, no examples. And if they do have the examples, they're always harping about these big companies like Amazon and Apple. When you choose to deconstruct a few of your favorite books, you start to build a wish list of what you would like the reader to experience. And that's what you'd like to experience in your own books, wouldn't you? So you've gone through the art of Kintsukuroi, the books that you've looked at were already quite impressive by your own reckoning. That is the reason that you chose them in the first place. But then, after you've broken them apart, you get to reconstruct them in a way that's more beautiful and more suited to you and your business than ever before. And this structured breaking and remaking process is what helps you put your information under a structural format that you can keep and evolve over the years. When you're outlining a book, it's easier to put pieces of content where there's already a category of space. So if you've got a space for summary, it's easier to put it there. If you've got a space for a recipe, it's easier to put it there. It's a lot less intimidating when you know what goes into that book structure in advance. 
Now, structural inspiration comes from many places. I love the music of Sting, and in one particular concert, he talked briefly about the inspiration behind several of his songs. For instance, did you know that Englishman in New York is not Sting singing about himself in New York? In the video, it sounds as if the song is about Sting, an Englishman, but in reality, it's about famed gay author Quentin Crisp and how he experienced being an outcast in New York. When I first heard that little bit of information, I was quite tickled. And so I decided to add that story about how we wrote our books. Since then, the structure of a psychotactics course or product has included the making of this book. And this includes photos and it includes a little story. So your question would be, if I copy the structure, won't it look similar? Did you know that my introduction and illustrations were influenced by Don't Make Me Think? Of course not. And even now, if you were to hold the Brain Audit and Steve Krug's book side by side, you're not likely to find too much of a resemblance. The key isn't to make an identical copy. Remember the procedure? You're breaking first, then you're reattaching it together. So there is this bit of additional input that's going to the structure. When the structure comes from you or from another source, it all helps to create that Kintsukuroi moment. It's construction after destruction or construction after deconstruction. So this is the kind of deconstruction that you want for your book as well. You could see it as a sort of template for all the books that you create in the future. What makes it truly beautiful is that the act of breaking up the structure of other books ends up with a stunning new creation. It's truly Kintsukuroi and helps create a powerful outline structure. So we worked our way through creating just three topics, that's what we started out with. Then we deconstructed and reconstructed the structure of our book. But finally, it's down to purpose. Why are we writing this book? Is it just to put words on paper or is there some other reason? Usually from December 20th to Jan 20th every year, I take a summer break. The days consist of no emails, endless episodes of detective series on Netflix, biographies, and beer. Eventually, December gives way to January, and New Zealand and I wake up from our month-long vacation. To ease myself back into work mode, I start reading business books. And this year, I started out with an outstanding book called The Content Trap by Bharat Anand. Just leafing through the introduction takes you well past 30 pages, and yet every moment of the introduction is gripping. But what is Bharat Anand's purpose? This is the question most writers need to ask themselves before sitting down to outline their books. Is this book meant to create consulting? Are you expecting to improve your profile? Would you hope to do a speaking tour as a result of the book becoming a bestseller? Would companies hire you to solve their problems? And would it involve big business or just small firms? In the case of The Content Trap, my perception was that the book was aimed at bigger companies. The examples in the book were amazing, but they were Amazon, the Scandinavian newspaper company, the New York Times, the sports magazine giant IMG, and Harvard Business. Well, Harvard Business is school's own content management system. These examples leave me and most other readers in a sort of trap of our own. We have all of these utterly outstanding examples, but all of them are companies that are high and mighty. Even if we were to admire the sheer depth of learning, how would someone like you or me put this information to use? And this is where the purpose comes right in. You need to be very clear about why you're writing the book. In Bharat Anand's case, he's got a great idea. He's got scintillating data to back up his concept. But it falls apart at the seams because 
there is no way to use it. Could it be that the book is designed to give potential clients an idea of what's possible? Could it be that they call in the author for an extensive consulting session? Many books are written with the goal of getting consulting in mind. Could this be one of them? When I sat down to write an outline, I wasn't always clear about the goal. The early years saw me create sparse outlines and then fill content into those books. Now, this was my way of battling my seeming insecurity. I didn't see myself as a marketing person. I saw myself as a cartoonist. The greater number of pages I had in the book, the more I felt secure, the less I had to worry about refunds. It didn't help very much when some early buyers, and we're going back to the year 2003 or so, So what they said was, we are returning the book. There are too few pages in it. Back then, most of us were still walking into bookstores. We were stepping out with books which cost $20, and they were hardback books. And there we were. We were selling a PDF for $67, and it consisted of fewer than 10 pages. Hence, I had this need to fix the book by adding a ton of material, a ton of pages, that may not have been needed. Yet today, when I outline the book, the main goal is to get a precise result. So if you buy a book on presentations, you could be woken up at 3 a.m. and still be able to put together a very compelling presentation. And you could do this from the ground up. If you spent your hard-earned money on the Information Products course, you would find that It has a very well thought out template on how to create information products. Whether it's photography, article writing or landing pages, the goal is well defined before I start to write. And this is something that you should do. It seems like such a tiny inconsequential part of the outlining process, and yet it's crucial. What's the end point when the book comes out? Is it to get you more consulting? Is it to get you more fame? Is it to create a permanent source of income and nothing else? Knowing the end point makes a difference to the examples you give and how you structure the book. Knowing where you're going is very important because it applies to everything in life, but especially when you're outlining a book. Once you know exactly where you're going, you can focus your energy better than ever before. So that brings us to the end of this podcast and I trust you learned a lot about how to put that book together, how to outline that book. So what did we cover? We started out with element one, the first one, which is always the same thing as this podcast or anywhere else that you see our work. And that is to cover just three points. Even if you come to a workshop, a psychotactics workshop, which lasts two or three days. Well, we'll just cover three points and we'll go deep into those three points. And that way, you as a client learn something that you can implement. In fact, now we've taken it a step further where you implement before you leave the workshop. But it's always three points. And you can do almost everything that you want to achieve in those three points. So we did three points. What was the second thing that we covered? The second thing was deconstruction. You want to look at other books and look at the structure of the books. What are the elements that they have? Do they have cartoons? Do they have summaries? Do they have captions? Do they have this? Do they have that? What do they have in those books? And when you know that, you can break it apart and then put it together in your own kind of format. And that makes it so beautiful because now you've created a book that is just outstanding. I was looking at Steve Krogh's book, the second book, and... I forget what it was right now, but there was something and I took a photo of it and I go, that needs to go in our next book. And so you want to deconstruct that Kintsukuroi, say it, Kintsukuroi, that's the thing that you need to do. Break it apart and put it together so it's better than before. And finally, element three is you've got to understand the purpose of the book. You can't just write a book. There's no point in just writing a book. What is the audience that you're looking to get? Who is it going to? Is it going to corporates? Is it going to the average person? Are they going to implement it? Or are they going to call you in for consulting? 
Some people just write books so that they're so complex, so they call you in. But you don't have to do that because even the simplest book requires a client to say, well, give me some more stuff. So when people read the brain audit, I write everything that I can possibly put in the brain audit. And they still say, well, can we have a brain audit workshop? Can we have brain audit class? Can we have a brain audit course? So it's, it's not that just because you put everything in the book that they're never going to call you again. And that's the fear that some people have. So they won't put stuff in the book. They won't structure the book in a way that's easy to comprehend. And believe me, you can just give it away, all that information, and people still come back for the next level up. And that brings us to the end of this episode on how to outline a book. What's happening in Psychotactics land? At least for the last few days, the meditation isn't working. The whole of the last month, last couple of months actually, I have been waking up with the alarm going off. And so I've been really sleeping. And then at four o'clock the alarm goes off and then I meditate with the alarm being that chant, that meditation chant, and that wakes me up. The last few days haven't been that good. I don't know, maybe it's the heat. It's pretty hot here. In fact, right now, it's 5.33 and it's not a.m., it's p.m. And the reason I'm doing this at 5.33 p.m. is because I couldn't wake up this morning and I couldn't wake up yesterday morning either. So (laughs) that's just the flip side of how things work. However, that's just our day-to-day life. What's happening in the months to come? One of the things that we're doing is we're going to be traveling to Sweden and then to Amsterdam and then finally to Singapore. Now, if you want to meet up with us, we have just 12 people that we're going to meet with. It's not expensive. I think it's about 21 euros or 21 dollars. And we're going to have like a three hour meetup. We're going to pay for the refreshments. And really what you're paying for is just the cost of the refreshments. So go to psychotactics.com slash meetup. Remember, there are just 12 slots. If you don't get there, you don't get there. So psychotactics.com slash meetup. Now going off on a completely different tangent, people often ask me who does your website? And actually who does our websites? The people that do our websites are called stresslessweb.com. That's three things you have to remember. Stresslessweb.com. And what is important at this stage is SSL. I don't know if you've noticed, but Google had a deadline and they said if you didn't meet that deadline, then they would start just marking your pages as unsafe. So you need to go to HTTPS. And if you haven't done that, then it's very likely that when your clients are going to your pages, they're coming up as unsafe. And that's not good for your business or anybody's business. And so we had to do that. We had to go and change all our pages to HTTPS. And this was done by stresslessweb.com. So you want to check them out and they probably do your website. And if nothing else, they'll do this SSL stuff. It's not as crazy as you think, but they do a really good job. So go to stresslessweb.com and that's pretty much it. This is Sean D'Souza saying bye from Psychotactics Land and 5000 BC. Bye for now.